Okay, hello. <clears throat> so um, there's three main topics I want to talk about this time. Um, um, hopefully I will get to all of them. Um, so the first one is, I mean, these three things pretty much go together in luck, freedom, morality, and personal identity. Um, and the second one is, these distinctions that he introduces at the end, and especially this one, the distinction between adequate and inadequate concepts. Hey. Or sorry, ideas. <laughs> you have to you have to forgive me because I switched from con course to this course. So I'm still thinking concepts, concepts, but no, ideas, right. <laughs> uh, adequate and inadequate ideas. And the third one is association of ideas, which according to Locke is the cause of madness. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to start with the first one first. Um, so freedom So first of all, freedom or liberty right? Locke uses these interchangeably. It's just English versus Latin. Um, Locke says is power. What power is it? Well, it's the power to do or not do, depending on the will. Right, so I'm free when, uh, that is, I do something freely when, I have the I had the power to do it or not to do it, depending on which I wanted. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess um, let's start. I want to stop here to say something about where the idea of power comes from in general. Um, it's uh, <clears throat> Locke says at the beginning of the chapter on power, Locke says that we get the idea of power because we see changes or we perceive changes, right? Not necessarily see. We perceive changes in external things. And we collect, that is, I guess, infer um, that uh, there must be a power to cause the change. But that's very weird, right? Especially if power is a simple idea. So first of all, as Hume is going to point out, that according to Locke himself, we can't get a simple idea this way by inferring something. The mind can't make its own simple ideas, right? The simple idea has to come through sensation or reflection. But um, it's also weird just when you ask what um, perceiving or observing a change means. So the changes that we're perceiving are changes in the powers of the external objects to affect us. 
and um and Locke actually says that as he goes on to discuss power right he says that like all these powers terminate in a power to cause um a sensation in me Okay, I so uh, um, should I read this? <laughs> Josephine says in the chat, it's a special kind of fucked up vibe reading a guy who framed the Constitution for a weird slave or neo feudal society describing in technical terms just precisely what it is he wanted to take away from those in bondage. All right, that's, I mean. <clears throat> Without denying that it's important to know that about Locke in order to understand um, Locke, I think that that way of portraying it is very misleading. Um, but like, I don't have very much, I don't have time to go into it. <laughs> um, in in this course, I, I, you know, when I teach Locke's political philosophy in 144, I say a lot more about it. But the, you know, the truth is, Number one, he wrote that constitution a long time before he wrote this book. Number two, he didn't actually write it and publish it under his own name, right? It's assumed that he wrote it. I mean, I think it's clear that he wrote it, but he wrote it because he was the secretary to the Lord's proprietor of Cal Carolina. Now, obviously, the idea of creating a new neo-feudal society, um, uh, I mean, if you know anything about Locke's political philosophy, you'll know that he had no interest in that, at least not by the time he wrote this book. But it seems pretty clear where that idea came from, namely from the Lord's proprietor of the colony of Carolina, right? So they said, Locke, we want you to write, to write us a feudal constitution. Slavery gets mentioned in an aside, in, a, in like a weird way where, I mean, I think it seems pretty clear that someone, someone looked at something that Locke had written and said, hey, this looks like it means we have to free our slaves. You better write that we don't have to. And that's where he mentioned it. I, you know, so, uh, um, but like, I think we'll see when he talks about um, the uh, basis of morality and different kinds of people in this book um that it's uh like even what he says in this book never mind what he says in the second treatise is completely inconsistent with that kind of system so that that's all i have to say about that uh, at least for now all right so but i was here i was talking about something um seemingly very far removed from these practical political issues. But as we just saw, it isn't. <laughs> you should pay attention. But in any case, right, I was just talking about where we get the idea of power and, um, uh, and like, in a nutshell, it looks like when Locke talks about where we get the idea of power at the beginning of this section, he's... He really assumes that we already have the idea of power and that it comes with every sensation. A sensation is a sensation of the power to cause that sensation. And that that's really the simple idea. Um, but why doesn't he say that? Well, maybe he's actually as confused about it. I'm not sure. In any case, that's completely, or not completely, but that's, not directly relevant to what I to, to what I want to talk about. So what I want to talk about is what power, freedom, or liberty is. So he says that it's the power to do or not to do, depending on my preference, depending on my will. So the first result of that is then if you ask, is the will free? You're asking whether the will has this power. Well, what is the will? Well, the will is also a power. 
The will is a power to prefer one thing rather than another. And Locke says, this question is ridiculous. Right? He says it's just as good as asking, we're asking whether the will is free is just as good as asking whether, whether someone's sleep is swift. I mean, there is a line in a Dr. Seuss book about that, but who also has some political issues. But in any case, um, right? It's like asking whether someone's sleep is swift. Sleep isn't something you can do slowly or 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 more or more quickly. Right? Similarly, the will isn't the kind of thing that can have a power. The will itself is a power. What has this power? That is, what can be free according to Locke? Well, um, a human being can be free. That is a substance, although he doesn't say that here, right? But this is why I said that um, it seems like clear from the way he talks about powers here that he himself is, is you know, um, finds himself using the idea of substance. So despite all the problems he identifies in it, he I don't think he thinks we can get away from it because it's, right, it's like central to his argument here that um, this type of power, which is like uh, quality, right? It's the, just as the quality of whiteness is the power to cause me to perceive the sensation of white, um, doesn't just float around on its own, nor can it be itself in another power. There has to be something that they're in, and that's the substance. It's the substance that's free. Right. So, I mean, <clears throat> so, the, so the first answer to this question, is the will free, is that's just a bad question. How relevant is that, actually? Well, I think it's not that relevant because it really just means that we put the question the wrong way, right? I mean, that's not what we wanted to ask. We didn't want to ask whether the power to prefer something has the power to do things depending on whether it prefers them. <laughs> um, so we said it that way. And I mean, Locke himself earlier on said that like this talk of faculties doing things, commanding each other, et cetera, is like, I think as Leibniz would put it, it can be given a perfectly good sense according to which there is nothing false in it, right? It just has to be understood carefully. So it's just, if you take it literally, it's a bad way of putting the question. But there was another question we meant to ask. So what question do we mean to ask? And by the way, I guess I should say, so I think Locke put, gives this answer first and emphasizes it and says, I hope this will bring an end to all this endless wrangling about whether the will is free, because I'm going to show that that's not even a good question. And then only after that does he um, bring out the question we actually meant to ask, two versions of it, actually. And it turns out that is a good question. And the answer is no. <laughs> so uh, I think, I hope I'm not attributing too much kind of cunning to Locke here. I think, you know, either for a certain kind of reader, well, for sure for a certain kind of reader, perhaps for a certain kind of censor. I mean, I don't know what the state of, I think um, there is no freedom of the will was like a Puritan doctrine, right? Like Jonathan Edwards is who I taught in 112, uh, whenever that was, two years ago, or was it last year? I don't know. <laughs> um, says that, uh, you know, argues at great length that the will is not free. Um, so I think therefore, with the Anglicans in charge, maybe you weren't supposed to say that. But but more to the point, I think like um, 
for a certain kind of reader, Locke wants them to go away saying, oh, that's not really a good question. I'm not going to worry myself about that. And only then does he actually say, no, the will isn't free. <laughs> Right. That is what you meant to ask. The answer is no. So what did you mean to ask? Well, I mean, the will is a power. But um, so the, um, the will has acts. Right. It's an action when we actually will something. And that is an action is the kind of thing that we can have the power to do or not to do depending on preference. So it made sense to ask, although according to, to Locke, the answer is kind of obviously no. But it, I mean, he asks it two different ways, but both times it's obviously no. It makes sense to ask, um, can I will, do I have the power to will something or not will it depending on my preference, right? So just as like, if I'm free to walk or stand still, that means I have the, the, the power to walk or not walk according to my preference. Similarly, you can ask, do I have the power to will or not will according to my preference? And I think, I mean, it's pretty clear when we ask whether the will is free, that's what we meant. So Locke proceeds to understand that in two different ways. Um, the first one um, is what he discusses in section 23 of chapter 21 of book two. And the first way of understanding this when we say, I have the power to will or not to will, depending on preference or depending on the will. <laughs> um, what that means is that I have a power either to will something or not to will anything. Right? That's So that's one way of understanding what you could be asking when you ask whether I have the power to will or not to will according to preference. Um, now, I mean, that again is probably not the version of it that most people had in mind when they asked whether the will was free, but it is actually an important question. And I think it's an attack on Descartes and others such as Stoics and skeptics who advise suspension of the will or suspension of judgment. Ray Locke is saying that that's impossible. I don't have a choice whether to will something or not. Right, in Descartes, it comes up in the, because Descartes thinks judging something to be true or affirming something is an act of the will, it comes up in, in that context, right? Where it's like, I can decide to neither affirm nor deny, right? So that would mean that I will, neither to affirm nor to deny. And because I have the power to will or not will, depending on the will, therefore I have the power to not will, meaning to not will at all, meaning to not affirm or deny this judgment. Um, and according to Descartes, that's what you should always do unless you, in a theoretical context anyway, that's what you should always do unless you have a clear and distinct perception of the truth of the judgment. And Locke says, that's just what you can't do. Now, there's some weird ways about th things about he how he proves that, but I think I'm not going to get into them um, because I want to go on to the other one, which is I think finally is something like what people are wondering when they wonder whether the will is free. I mean, what, what are people asking when they ask whether the will is free? Like, so, I mean, it's actually not at all easy to understand what they're asking, but at least I think it starts in a situation like this. Like I, I ask, you know, was I free to do that or not to do it? 
and you say, well, yes, you had the power to do it if you wanted to do it and not to do it if you didn't want to do it. So you were free. Um, and subtext, therefore you're responsible, <laughs> right? That's why this goes together with morality and personal identity. Therefore you're responsible. You did it freely. And Locke suggests that this second question comes up actually because we're looking for a loophole where we won't be responsible, <laughs> right? That this is actually, that what's going on here is not just theoretical confusion, but it actually uh, kind of um, um, attempt to get out of morality, to get out of our responsibilities. But anyway, so the question I ask then is, but hold on a second. Yeah, I did it because I wanted to, but I only wanted to because of something else, right? I wanted to because of what I wanted yesterday, and I wanted that because of something else. And eventually, if you get far enough back, it'll be, and that was because of the way I was educated or because of, you know, my innate characteristics or whatever. And you'll see that it wasn't my fault because although I was free to do this act or not to do it, depending whether I wanted to or not, I wasn't free whether to want it or not. Right, so in other words, what I'm worrying about is exactly this question. Do I have the power to will, right? So here we're filling in to will or not will, depending on the will. <laughs> and now will doesn't, to will doesn't mean to will in general, but it means to will X, right? So I have the power to will X or not to will X, where X is some action. And we said I was free to do X or not to do X because I would do X if I willed to do X, but I wouldn't do X if I willed not to do X. But now the question is, but was I free to will to do X? Or was that determined by something else? And if that was determined by something else, oh, it's not my fault after all. I was determined, I wasn't free, right? So like, so, so I think this is the question that people are really have on their minds when they ask whether the will is free, or at least it's a question that people have on their minds when they ask whether the will is free. And Locke says, um, that this also, the answer is obviously no, right? So this is book two, chapter 21, section 25 on page Um, for to ask whether a man, oops, for to ask whether a man be at liberty to will either motion or rest, speaking or silence, which he pleases. Right. So remember, the question isn't whether he's at liberty to move or stay at rest, speak or be silent. The question is whether they're at liberty to will to, to, be, at, to be in motion or at rest, to will to speak or be silent. Right. So it's like a question like this. I have the, I have the power to will to do X or not to will to do X. And he says, to ask that question is to ask whether a man can will what he wills or be pleased with what he is pleased with. A question which I think needs no answer, and they who can make a question of it must suppose one will to determine the acts of another and another to determine that, and so on in infinitum. Now, I mean, <laughs> I think this, the argument is a little bit imprecise. It's, I mean, it's so, it's not necessarily an infinite regress if we have this ability in some particular case, 
And maybe even sometimes we do have this ability. And I, I don't think Locke needs to deny that. I'm not sure he would deny that, right? That, that sometimes I can um, decide what which thing to will, but it can't be the case that I can always do that or else it would be an infinite regress. Right, if if every if every time I will to do something or not to do something, um, that's I'm always free to will one or the other. Then, um, so I was free to um, so I was I was free to move or stay at rest. I was free to will to move or to will to stay at rest. I was free to will to will to move or to will to will to stay at rest, and it's an infinite regress. And I guess I mean you can say something. You can say something more. It's not just that I, it can't be that I always can do it. It's that ultimately I get I must get back in that regress to a step where I'm not free. That's the only way it can stop. As long as you keep giving the answer right, then is. If I say, well, why did I move rather than staying at rest? And you say, well, because you were free to move or stay at rest and you willed to move. And then I say, well, why did I will to move? And if you say, well, it was because you were free to will to move or to will not to move and you willed to, to will to move. <laughs> um, and you've, you've just pushed the question back one step further. So eventually you have to give some other answer if it's not going to be an infinite regress. Why can't there be an infinite regress here? It's a good question. You always have to worry about that, right? Like when a philosopher says, and that would be an infinite regress, you have to stop and ask, maybe an infinite regress would be okay here. I think, um, the way Locke is thinking about it, whether this is right or not, is something like that an infinite series never comes to an end. So if you had to carry out an infinite series of acts of will in order to do anything, you would never, you would never get to the actual decision. Okay, so so like. This is what we really meant to ask when we asked, is the will free? And Locke's answer is no, the will is not free. And then if you ask, okay, what moves the mind to will one way or the other? That is, what is the motive This means what moves, <laughs> right? What moves the, the, the mind or the person that is the substance that has the power to will, what moves it to will one way rather than the other? And Locke says, basically, answer, pleasure, and pain. I mean, he actually gives a, a slightly more complicated answer. He says that um, pleasure moves us to will inaction or no change, whereas pain moves us to will action, that is to try to change something. Right? So, he, and he, I think because this is something that he changed his mind about. So in early editions, he said that he, he thought that pain and pleasure were completely symmetrical as motives, right? That were moved to seek pleasure and avoid pain. Um, and then later he decided, no, it's not symmetrical. And therefore he inserted a very, very long argument about that, which I didn't assign. <laughs> it's not that, I mean, it's interesting. It's an interesting point if it's true, but it's not that interesting. <laughs> Um, right, so notice the claim is that um, if I'm in pleasurable state A, and I could achieve, but, but the, and there's no pain or uneasiness, 
Sometimes he feels this uneasiness or dis-ease, right? This is not the, the our word disease. It's another word. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's the same word, obviously, but it means uneasiness, you know. So um, if, if, if there weren't something painful or uncomfortable about state A, then even if state B would be better, I'm not going to be moved to try to get to it. Okay, whether that's true or not, as I said, it's not that important. Um, what's what's important is that, um, so this view is what's, it's sometimes called psychological hedonism. by people who like to keep track of these things. Psychological hedonism is the doctrine that um, we always act due to pleasure and pain. I guess, strictly speaking, if it's hedonism, it's we always act due to pleasure, but add in and pain, <laughs> right? Okay, so, um, um, as right, as opposed to, Ethical hedonism. Ethical hedonism is the doctrine that what you ought to do is try to get pleasure. Basically, if you have psychological hedonism, then ethical hedonism is kind of like um, empty or redundant. I mean, that is what you're going to do. End of story, <laughs> right? It doesn't make sense to ask whether you should. Um, so this in itself, when Locke says that, like that, that what, what, the motive of the will is always pleasure or pain. Oh, and. Josephine asks, pain and pleasure are also faculties or powers in his scheme, right? No, uh, pain and pleasure are, are simple ideas, actually. Right? Pain and pleasure are simple ideas that are, that are attached to certain other ideas by our maker, <laughs> so that we should have motives to action. Um. Right, so yeah, they're not powers. Um, um, things have powers to cause pleasure or pain. And, um, but the pleasure, pleasure and pain themselves are, are, well, they come in by both sensation and reflection, as Locke says, they're simple ideas of both sensation and reflection. Um, you know, that there's one simple idea that applies to every kind of quote unquote pleasure. So, like eating a peanut butter sandwich and getting a paper published, or like there's some kind of like sensation that's the same in both of them. Like, that's not obvious. <laughs> um, all right, but anyway, that's what Locke says. There's one simple idea of pleasure and one simple idea of pain, and they come in different degrees, but that's that's it. Um, all right, so um, so that saying that in itself is not yet a moral doctrine at all. Um. Right. So pleasurability is a power. Yes. But as Locke points out, we don't usually think, I mean, we usually think of that as a bare power. We don't usually, we don't mistakenly think that that is a real property of the body. So that the pleasurableness is still there, even when no one's not feeling it. The way we think the whiteness is still there, even when no one's not seeing it. Um uh, although, according to Locke, that's a, that's a mistake. They really are the same. They're both bare powers. Um, okay. In fact, that's one of his main, right? That's when he talks about the mana. I don't know if I assigned that part or not. The mana, which is why 
and sweet, but also if you eat it, like if you eat it the next day, it will cause sickness and your cause pain in your intestines or whatever. Um, we think of the whiteness and the sweetness as in the mana, but not the pain, but actually they're, they're equally in it or not in it. Um, all right. So anyway, sorry. Um, so this in itself is not a moral doctrine. Um, but it does drive his um, definition of morality. So the definition of um, so the definition of moral good and evil um, comes in Book Two, Chapter Twenty Eight, Section Six. Now, this in itself is a little bit odd. Um, this is page 316. Um, where it is is a little odd, right? So this is this chapter is called of other relations. And it starts off, I didn't assign this part. I mean, it's interesting, but it's not that important. So I didn't assign it. And it seems kind of boring. It starts off by talking some other kinds of relations, like whiter, sweeter, bigger, father, son, brother, cousin. Um, And it seems like it's going to be kind of a boring chapter, maybe even a chapter that you might think of skipping. Now, you know, like people who write like to read philosophers this way, and I don't know, what do I think? Sometimes I feel like it's true. They really are doing this, that a philosopher will bury a dangerous doctrine in the middle of a boring chapter or with a boring title in the hopes that those it's not suited to will skip it. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's going on here, but it's certainly suspicious that his main dis discussion of morality in this book is like buried in this weird way. Why isn't there a chapter called morality or moral relations or moral good and evil or whatever? No, it's like section uh, five and section six so, okay, so this the discussion starts this way. Good and evil, as hath been shown, are nothing but pleasure and pain or that which occasions or produces pleasure or pain to us. Right, so first of all, this means that, oops, that according to Locke, the terms good and evil in themselves are relative. And who are they relative? What are they relative to? Right. Remember, they, when, when I say something that looks like an absolute is rel is actually relative is has a conceals a tacit relation. I mean that you really have to fill in for what or compared to what or something. And if you don't, you'll get into apparent contradictions, like an example of the tree and the mountain I was talking about last time, right? If you don't realize that big means big relative to some reference class, right? Then you won't realize that when you call a tree big, you don't, you're not actually saying the same thing about it as you're saying about the mountain when you call the mountain big. Not because the word big is ambiguous, but because the word big involves a tacit relation. And the same thing is true here. And here the tacit relation is to um, a person or, well, I guess really, I guess person is the right term here according to the law. Um, but um, that is when I say this is good, I mean, this brings me pleasure or is a means by which I can acquire pleasure. 
right? Those are the two types of um, good here. Um, this is, you know, um, um, pleasure and utility. Dulce and util, as Cicero says. And then there's supposed to be a third one that Flock is leaving off. <laughs> so, um, so good or evil means pleasure means that uh, it's referred to pleasure or the means of acquiring pleasure. And that's that's good, obviously. And evil it means pain or the means of acquiring pain. And whose pleasure or pain? Well, mine, right? So this is why in general, like if I say grapes are good and you say grapes are bad, we're not contradicting each other. I mean, grapes cause me pleasure and you mean grapes cause you pain. <laughs> and that's perfectly, that, that those, those two statements are perfectly consistent with each other. Okay, but so obviously the way I just defined good is is not what we normally call moral good. Um, so that is, when I say grapes are good, I don't mean they're morally good. So what does morally good mean? So Locke says, well, it's a special, it's a special kind of good. Morally good and evil, then, is only the conformity or disagreement of our voluntary actions to some law, whereby good or evil is drawn on us from the will and power of the lawmaker. Right? So um, so morally good and evil. So, right, this means pleasant or useful. And this means painful or disuseful, whatever the right word here is. So morally good and evil is a special type. Now, it's a special type of what? Well, it's a special type of these two, right? Because... When I say that an action is morally good, what I mean is that doing that action is a means to bring pleasure on myself due to the will of a lawmaker. And when I say it's morally evil, I mean it's a means to bring pain upon myself due to the will of the lawmaker. Um, and Locke says that a lawmaker must always annex pain and pleasure, that is, punishments and rewards, to the, you know, um, breaking or observance of their law. And that's where the psychological hedonism comes in. Um, right, so going back, this is the next section, section six. Um, for since it would be utterly in vain to suppose a rule set to the free actions of man without annexing to it some enforcement of good and evil to determine his will, we must, wherever we suppose a law, suppose also some reward and punishment annexed to that law. Right? Because what I will do <laughs> is what I um, believe will retain pleasure and avoid pain for me, something like that. Um, so, uh, but um, but part, one, one kind of pain I want to avoid is the pain of desire, right? That's how future pleasures come in. Um, right, if we, well, I don't know, I'm gonna get entangled in that. But let's just say, so what I will do is seek pleasure and avoid pain. 
So it's no, no good to tell me to do something. But by the way, doing this isn't going to get you pleasure or it is going to get you pain because I just, I won't do it. <laughs> That's psychological hedonism, right? So it's utterly in vain, as Locke says, to set a rule to the free actions of man. A law, of course, is a rule to the free actions of man. Meaning, like, um, if you shut me up in a box, you don't have to make a law that I can't leave the box. I can't leave the box. <laughs> Right. The law only comes in when I'm free. That is when I have the power to do or not to do according to my preference. And now you want to determine my preference. Right. So I have the power to stay in this room or leave this room, depending on which I will. And you want me to stay in this room. How are you going to do that? Well, so you have to do you have to supply the thing that moves my will, the motive that moves my will. What is that? Well, pain and pleasure. Right? So every law is um consists of a lawmaker who says do this or don't do that, and annexes rewards and or punishments in such a way as to give you a motive. So like on the one hand, morally good and evil are so to speak less relative than good and evil in general. Why? Because if the lawmaker makes the same law for everyone, and in fact, this is that's this is that's like a cornerstone of Locke's political philosophy, that the legislative only has the power to make universal laws. It doesn't have the power to um, make laws for individuals. So, um, right, so if um, um, if the lawmaker makes the same law for everyone, then now we're going to have a large area of agreement about what's good and what's evil. Right, and as I say, you know, like, um, it's evil to steal. I mean, if I steal, the lawmaker will punish me. But it's not only me. If anyone steals the law, make sure we'll punish them. So we'll all agree about that, right? But there is still a relativity here. And that means that Locke is a moral relativist, right? Moral relativism is the view that moral good and evil are relative, are secretly relative predicates. They contain a tacit relation. And what is the relation? Well, it's the relation to the lawmaker. Right, so depending on which lawmaker you're talking about, different things are going to be good or evil. And in fact, you know, so Locke is going to talk about these three different kinds of law, the divine or natural law, the civil law, and the law of virtue. And when he talks about the law of virtue, basically, um, he makes... Uh, all the usual arguments for what we call cultural relativism. Now, what's this argument here? Okay, so Josephine says, when you say everyone, you mean all citizens of the community, right? Um, um, Well, so you like like you mentioned a lot, a number of different. I mean, really, if you want to get into this detail, but I don't know when I'm going to teach 144 again, so maybe I should try to answer it. But um, so, like, uh, babies is yes, law doesn't apply to babies. Why? Because they're unable to anticipate pain or or pleasure due to breaking the law or keep, or keeping the law. Um, so, I mean, what that means actually is that babies are uh, children in general before they reach the age of reason are kind of dangerous. Um, 
right? That is the law won't restrain them. So uh, that's why Locke says that Locke says parental authority and he stops there to make an argument that people talk about paternal authority, but that it's it's in the mother and the father, it's parental authority. And he says, parental authority exists for the for the protection of the child. And I mean, that means a number, I mean, I, I think what he has in mind is not mostly, hey, don't go run out to the street. What he has in mind mostly is that the parents have to vouch for the, that the child won't injure other people. <laughs> Otherwise the child would be treated as a wild animal. <laughs> Right. It doesn't rec it can't be part of a social contract. Um, that doesn't apply to any of the other cases you talk about. So non-citizens, I think I think Locke is pretty clear that non-citizens, while they're using the the public ways inside a certain uh commonwealth, are subject to the same law as everyone else. Foreign diplomats maybe is an exception because of a certain compact between the princes that is the executives of the two different commonwealths. Um, and women, the only the only thing that Locke says in the, um, and he's arguing against this, uh, like, um, um this guy whose book's title was actually patriarchy that's where the word patriarchy comes from <laughs> so he's like he's the first uh i'm spending too long talking about this but i'll just say like the only place in in the in, in the second treatise where there's an asymmetry mentioned between men and women is that Locke says that when there's a dispute about what to um, tell the children, then by default, the man should take precedence because the men are stronger, which is not a very convincing reason. But it's also very, very limited. I mean, especially if you like if you've ever had children, you know that usually the last thing you want to do is like you always want to present a, a united front. <laughs> Right, you, you want to say like, do what your mother said, right? You don't want to say, oh no, I'm using my extra authority to veto it. Um, that way lies all kinds of trouble. So I think you know, he 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 does he does justify that, which of course is what he finds in his society. But um, but he doesn't he doesn't he doesn't justify he doesn't like unlike Thomas Jefferson, he doesn't at least anywhere in the Second Treatise explain why women shouldn't be citizens or shouldn't vote or whatever. What he thought about that, I'm not sure. Maybe he talks about it somewhere else in a letter or somewhere, but I don't know. Um, um, okay. Um, sorry, so getting back to this, that was really a digression because it was all, that was, all just because I said the lawmaker has to make the same law for everyone. But what I was what I was starting to say was they have to make the same law for everyone, but there's more than one lawgiver. And um, and what I was saying, they, you know, when Locke talks about the law of virtue, which is in which the lawgiver is society or your society, and the punishments and rewards are the opinions people have of you. And Locke says, if you don't think that's a strong punishment or reward, you don't know very much about human nature, right? As, as a matter of fact, people fear that more than the civil law or the divine law, <laughs> right? So they'll, they, you know, if, if, if their society, the people they hang out with, their club, as he sometimes says, disapproves of something, then they're going to like break the law of the country and the, the divine law and whatever, rather than face that disapproval usually. So Rennie, anyway, so that's the law of virtue. And, you know, when Locke talks about that, he basically says the same things that we would say if, if you were, if we wanted to defend cultural relativism, right? Like what people here, one place think is bad and another place they think is good. And who's to say who's right? 
So when it comes to the law of virtue, not only is he a moral relativist, but he's a moral relativist of a, of a kind that's familiar to us, right? That is, when it comes to the law of virtue, and you ask, is this morally good, or is it morally evil? And you're, you, you have in mind that the lawmaker is the club or society of the person you're talking about, then the answer is, it depends. <laughs> Right? Like, what's morally good in one society is morally evil in another one. And, you know, I think he uses the term club here. You know, he, he wants to emphasize that not necessarily everyone who lives in the same place, at least not for all purposes, belongs to the quote unquote same society. Right? So, like, what in certain circles, <laughs> is even in the same country at the same time, what in certain circles is, is thought of as virtuous in other circles is thought of as vicious. Um, and so if you wanna ask, according to the law of virtue, is this good or evil? You have to ask who are we talking about and who is their club? <laughs> okay. Um, But he gets something like absolute morality out of this only because um, he attributes to God as a lawmaker an infinite power of reward and punishment applied with infinite accuracy and precision. And it's infinite in Locke's sense of infinite, I think, is all he needs here, right? That is... No matter what finite reward or punishment some other lawmaker uh, proposes, God can do better than that. Right? So that means if you believe that, and Locke thinks that we can prove that, that is, Locke thinks anyone can prove that. In other words, the proof can't be from the Bible. Because number one, not as not everyone has seen the Bible, um, and number two, as Locke says elsewhere in this book, um, it's really hard to understand the Bible, <laughs> right? So even if we even if we agree a hundred percent that every word in the Bible is divine revelation, that's not sufficient to promulgate the moral law. The moral law is promulgated by our reason. That is, we're able to determine that God exists and that these are the things God would reward in punishment and that reward or punish, and that God's reward or punishment could always be greater than the one proposed by either the commonwealth, that is the civil lawmaker, or our fellow members of our club, that is the makers of the law of virtue. The divine law, which is also called the natural law. It's called natural because we can deduce it by our nature. We don't, as it's as opposed to revealed or positive law. Um, so the divine law or or natural law, um, uh, if we if we followed that proof and if we always pay attention, then we always would follow that law. Right, and that's why he said way back when, um, in book one, um, Here it is. Book one, chapter three, section six. The true ground of morality. Wait, I can't see what I point to. The true ground of morality, which can only be the will and law of a God who sees men in the dark, has in his hands rewards and punishments, and power enough to call to account the proudest offender. Right, so that he's he's zeroing in on the divine attributes that are relevant to morality, namely that um, uh, God has 
enough as much power to roar or punish as necessary and um that you can't get away with anything because he sees men in the dark <laughs> okay but what is it what is it that the what law has god supposedly made by the way one of the tensions between this book and the second treatise is that in the second treatise, so this way of saying that um, God both makes this law and enforces it is as much to say that God is the executive of the law of nature, not only the legislative, but also the executive. In the second treatise, it seems like the executive of the law of nature is everyone, right? Locke says in a state of nature, everyone has the right to reward and punish. But all right, I, I don't know how to reconcile those, so I, I just bring that up and I'll go on. Um, so what is the divine law? And how can we know what it is, right? So we already ruled out, like it can't be that we know what it is by looking in some book or something. How do we know what it is? There must be some principle from which we can figure out what kind of things God would reward or punish. Um, Well, um, well, let me start with this. How do we know that God has given us any law? I mean, you know, um, he proves, uh, when he proves the existence of God, he proves that God has power and wisdom and whatever, but how do we know that God has given a law? So this is what he says about that. Oops. Am I? Oh, I'm already on this. Okay. That's what he says about that. This is book two, chapter 28, section eight on page 317 that God has given a rule whereby men should govern themselves, I think there is nobody so brutish as to deny. I mean, this is, you might think this is an exception of the word, using the word brute to mean non-human animal, but I think it's not actually. Brutish here means irrational. Um, and, um, even though we don't really use rational as the distinction between humans and other animals, if human were going to be a morally relevant uh, sort, then that is what we should be using. <laughs> so I think there is nobody so brutish as to deny. He has a right to do it. What does that mean exactly? We are his creatures. I mean... That doesn't probably mean much if you go back and figure out how Locke would define right. But okay, how about this? He has goodness and wisdom to direct our actions to that which is best. Okay, this is weird. Right? Do you see why this is so weird? We're saying, how do we know that God has made a law and... So when we ask what's morally good or evil, we're asking um, what's in conformity to, in, in this absolute sense, that is according to the divine law, we're asking what's in conformity with God's law and what isn't. And now we're being told, like, how do you know that God made a law and what does the content have, of it have to be? And the answer is that um, God made laws in order to direct our actions to that which is best. But this seems, if best means morally good, then that's completely circular. Right? Because we were using the content of God's demand, of God's command to figure out what morally good and evil mean. 
So it can't be that. What does it mean? Well, this is what he says a little bit further on. This is in section 11 of the same chapter on page 320. There being nothing that's so, it's so uh, like to, before this, he's saying that um, that the law of virtue, that is the law of opinion, often lines up with the divine law. Not always, but often does. And why is that? There being nothing that so directly and visibly secures and advances the general good of mankind in this world as obedience to the laws he has set them and nothing that breeds such mischiefs and, and confusion as the neglect of them. And therefore, men, without renouncing all sense and reason and their own interest, which they are so constantly true to, could not generally mistake in placing their commendation and blame on that side that really deserved it not. Right? So what he's saying is, um, uh, following the um the divine laws and i mean if again we don't first have a list of divine laws and then notice this about them this must be the way we figure out what they are right so following the divine law um infallibly leads to what is best for mankind where best means not morally best, but just best in general, <laughs> right? So that is following these laws is brings pleasure and therefore is useful to mankind. And so if you take a bunch of people and ask, what's your opinion about doing this action? And the action is against the divine law. Then for the most part, when they're thinking clearly, even if they don't know anything about God and whatever, they're going to look at that action and say, well, people doing that action are, are bringing pain to mankind in general. And one of mankind in general is me. <laughs> so I don't want them to do that. And so I disapprove of this. Right, so that's why the law of virtue tends to line up with the divine law. So the divine laws are the laws that um, direct us to do what's most useful and pleasurable. Well, then you might think that this violates another condition that Locke originally put on laws. This is a condition that Locke attaches that Leibniz and Hobbes do not attach. Um, um, okay, here it is. It's it's back in section six on page three sixteen. Um, It would be in vain for one intelligent being to set a rule to the actions of another if he had it not in his power to reward the compliance with and punish deviation from his rule by some good and evil that is not the natural product and consequence of the action itself. Oops, again, you can't see what I'm pointing to, sorry. It would be in vain for one intelligent being to set a rule to the actions of another if he had it not in his power to reward the compliance with and punish deviation from his rule by some good and evil that is some pleasure and pain that is not the natural product and consequence of the action itself. Right? So what he's saying is it's not if if the pain that's going to follow from breaking this law is a natural consequence of that action, then the law is irrelevant, right? I mean, uh, sure enough, that pain will may deter me from doing the action, but that has nothing to do with the law, right? I'm not refraining from doing it because of the law. It's because of its natural consequence. So to count as morally good and evil, um, to count as morally good and evil, something has to bring good and evil as reward and punishment. And that means it has to be non-natural consequences. 
But wait, we just said that the natural consequence of obeying the divine law is pleasure for mankind. So doesn't that mean it's not a law at all? So I think the answer is, um, what's morally good and evil is what's publicly useful. Right? It's best for mankind in general. Um, why mankind in particular? So I think probably the answer is it's not in particular. It probably would apply to rational parrots as well. That is, if they're capable of understanding reward and punishment, and we know that about them, then we would have the same moral duties to them as we have to each other, I think. He doesn't say that anywhere explicitly. Yeah, utilitarianism. Yes, but notice that it's that it's um, utilitarianism comes out as a consequence of the proof that there's a divine lawmaker, right? That is, if there weren't a divine lawmaker, then the fact that something is publicly useful wouldn't give me a motive to do it. And so I wouldn't do it. That's the psychological hedonism. So preaching utilitarianism to me would be useless, right? I would still only do it if it gave, I'm only going to do it if it brings me pleasure or avoids pain for me. I mean, I guess maybe I would still do it if I so identified with mankind that pleasure for mankind brought pleasure to me and pain for mankind. And I don't know why I keep saying mankind humanity right but because Locke says mankind but like i said it really means rational beings i think so anyway like uh if i had such sympathy universal sympathy that a pain to someone else was as bad to me as a pain to myself that is it caused me the exact same pain then maybe i could i would be a utilitarianism without having a law but of course we all know that's not true <laughs> right i mean yeah pain and pleasure to others does matter to us we we do have sympathy but not that much <laughs> right so um so what how could there possibly be a motive for me to seek the public good rather than my own i mean we understand why i have a motive to to approve of what contributes to the public good. Because now I'm part of the public, right? So I don't want this person to be doing what's what's not for the good of the public because it's going to harm me in general. But uh, but that doesn't that that still leaves me hoping that no one notice will notice as I try to get out of it, right? So, like, the only way to give me, according to this view, the only way to give me a motive to seek public utility is there, for there to be a lawmaker who's going to always um, outbid whatever my personal interest is that goes against the public interest. Right? So no matter how much I... And think I can gain out of going against the public interest. Um, then after I go through this proof of the existence of God and whatever, I'll conclude, oh, wait, but God has infinite power and accuracy. And what I don't, of course, we don't know what infinite power and accuracy means, like all added up. But we know it means that he's better than any finite power and accuracy. And so in particular, whatever I was trying, thinking I would get out of um, going against the public good, the divine punishment's going to be worse. And obviously this must mean in the afterlife, right? Because anyway, it seems pretty obvious. Not everyone has ever has always agreed with this. There may even be way, ways of looking at things where it's not obvious at all, but never mind that. Uh, 
Um, it, it seems obvious that people often go against the public good and never get punished. So we must say the punishment happens somewhere else in another life or whatever. Um, right? And that's why, again, way back when, Locke said that people who keep the rules of morality for other reasons, because they're generally approved of in their society, that's the law of virtue, um, because they need to follow them at least with a with a small group of other people, otherwise, even if they're thieves, because otherwise their band of thieves would fall apart. You know, like people who have or or the hobbist who says you should uh, you should keep the laws of morality because otherwise the Leviathan will punish you. Right. Like all those people don't have the true basis of morality and the true basis of morality is can only be the will of a God who sees men in the dark and whatever. Right. That is that. Um, um, those other things don't provide sufficient motive. Okay. Um, that's most of what, well, no, I can, I'm still going to talk about personal identity. Seems clear that I'm not going to get very far into those other two things, but oh well, we'll see what happens. <laughs> I think this happens every year, but oh well. Okay, so, um, so, but okay, so that's the other thing I want to say about the main like basis of the theory of morality in Locke. And notice that you don't have to be free. Um, you just have to have a will that can be determined by by reward and punishment. That's what you need to be subject to a moral law of one kind or another. So that's why, like I said, um, infants are not. Um, no one is until they reach the age of reason, whatever that is. <laughs> Okay. Um, sometimes I think I haven't reached it yet, but all right. Um, but now, so now I want to go on to discuss this other topic, which, as you as we'll see, is closely related to all of this stuff, namely the question of personal identity. Right. So remember what I said about Locke's. Um, view about identity in general is that, first of all, identity is always a relationship between something at one time and something at another time. This is time, this is space. They call it next level. All right. So um, it's always a relationship between something at this time and something at this time. And I'm drawing in this line, but I mean, I shouldn't draw in this line because the question is, is this the, is this thing at this time the same as this thing at that time? Are they the same? What? And Locke says, in general, the answer will depend on how you fill in that what. Right? So like, example, you know, at this time, well, here, I guess, place is going to stay the same. At this time, is a little tiny oak sapling at this time in the same place. I mean, is it the same place? Not really. The earth has been rotating and whatever. I, you know, let, oh, it's not going to Okay. But anyway, at this time, at the same place is a huge oak tree. Now, if you ask, for example, is this the same mass of matter as this? Right, so that's a question about identity. Is this, are, is this at this time the same mass of matter as this was at this time? The answer is no. I mean, obviously not because there's so much more <laughs> of this. Um, but it's worse than that too, right? Because living things are constantly exchanging matter with, what, with their environment. So, um, so in fact, most of the matter that was in this thing at this time, at this time is probably spread out all over the place. 
So if you ask, where is the mass of matter that was all here at this time? The answer is it's spread out. Um, but if you ask, is this the same oak tree? Then the answer might be yes. Let's assume the answer is yes. So what does that mean? Well, I mean, we're using, um, we have a different purpose in mind in asking the question, and therefore we're using a different criterion for what counts as the same. And in this case, we're using the um, continuity of the organic process. Right, the, like the function of nutrition and what mostly nutrition, I guess, that this thing was carrying out, um, you know, resulted as, as in a slightly different thing at a later time and so on and so forth. And in the end, we got to this. And it doesn't matter that it's not the same matter. <laughs> is, is, is that example clear? Right, so it's in the same context he discussed. Zoe last time brought up the, sh the ship of, C of Theseus, right? Like, at least if we want to say that it is the same ship, this is how Locke would explain that. That, you know, the for the, the purpose we have in mind here, the right criterion is that, like, um, this is made for a certain purpose, and it like maintains it, all its changes in between here are by way of maintaining it for that same purpose. So even though every plank changed, um, and therefore it's not the same mass of matter, um, it's the same ship. You know, it's, I'm not sure whether Locke thinks that there's a case where we're asking about real identity. Sometimes it seems like there is, right? That like, if you, that, that if you have literally the same like tiny piece of matter and you find it here, then these aren't just the same for some purposes, but they're really the same or something like that. Um, but other times it seems like maybe, no, he thinks the question only makes sense if you first have some purpose in mind. Anyway, that doesn't much matter because uh, in the case of personal identity, we're definitely not going to be talking about that. So what is personal identity? So first of all, Locke says it's not the same idea, same as the unity of, well, he says the unity of man, let's say of a human, right? So if you ask, is this human the same as this human, this human at this time, the same as this human at this time? How do we answer that? And he says, well, it's pretty much just like the tree. Right, it's like for plants and animals, and, and we're animals too, the way you determine if it's the same thing is by seeing if there's a unity, the right kind of continuity of organic process between the two. But he says, person is not the same idea as human. And when we ask if it's the same person, we're not asking this, we don't have the same purpose in mind and we're not asking the same question. So what is the purpose that we have in mind where we ask whether something is the same person? And Locke says, this is book two, chapter uh, 27, section 26. He says, person is a forensic term. Meaning, roughly speaking, this is the same person as this. If this is responsible for this one's actions, Sorry, that was page 312 that I just read where it says it's a forensic concept. 
Book two, chapter 27, section 26, is a forensic term, a concept. He doesn't, I don't think even the word concept was even used in English at this time. Sometimes the people talk about conceptions. Um, you know, William Hamilton then complains, how come we can't say concept instead of conception? And now we do say concept. <laughs> All right. Anyway, that's so um so that is roughly speaking, person to say it's a forensic term, it means it's like a legal term. Right? We're 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 asking about legal personality. We want to know in particular, um, um can this one be punished? For this one's actions. Now, what does it mean? Can this one be punished for this one's actions? I mean, you might think, yeah, you could punish anyone for this one's actions, right? Like, I could decide to punish the oak tree for the this one's actions if I want. Why not? But that see, that wouldn't be punishment because remember the rule of the the role of punishment in this scheme is to. Um, provide an evil that is a pain, which um, this one will want to avoid. And because this one wants to avoid that pain, they won't do the action. And this one doesn't want to avoid pain to the oak tree. At least not directly. I mean, there's 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 something weird here again because of sympathy. I mean, let's if, let's if, suppose you think that oak trees can feel pain. I mean, if oak trees can't feel pain, which probably they can't, but I don't even know what the question is there. But in any case, if oak if oak trees can't feel pain, then obviously this one, you know, can't be motivated by punishing. You can't punish the oak tree at all. But suppose you think oak trees can feel pain. Well, you know, so then I might sympathize with the oak tree and therefore want to uh, uh, reduce its pain. But right, but according to psychological hedonism, that just means that the oak tree's pain will cause me pain, and it's really my pain that I'm trying to avoid. Right, that is, that's what sympathy consists in. That when the oak tree feels pain, I feel some derivative pain. And that's what I'm trying to avoid, right? So, um, so like punishing the oak tree might be some kind of deterrence, but only because it might be a way of punishing me. Um, and in fact, if you don't think about it, too hard, uh, maybe even, I mean, a lot of people who have thought hard have, have ended up going for schemes like this. You might think it made sense to punish me by punishing my family members or whatever. Um, I think, you know, the problem comes in with what kind of incentive you're then providing to them and what, you know, can it all work out? <laughs> right. So I'm sorry, I got, I got really tied up there in details that I shouldn't have. The basic idea is this <laughs> that the one you can the one you the only one you can punish at this time for this one's actions at the earlier time is the one this one cared about. <laughs> right? So it's the one this one thought was they were going to be at this time. So Locke says, and there's there's a step here that I don't understand, and therefore I'm sure it's important, but Locke says, who do I care about at this future time? Well, so it's the one who has the same consciousness as me. And I sort of understand like, remember, I, when I was talking about Locke's view about memory, that, you know, it seems like he thinks that in memory, I, my object is the past object. 
so that um, um, I can be as, as assured that there that because I remember something that there was an object as I am because I perceive something that there is an object. <clears throat> The only question might be that I'm wrong about what I remember or about what time it happened or whatever. Um, so, um, so, so in some sense, like the me that I remember is um, the me whose perceptions I like. Um, I kind of go through again now right i have the same i have the past objects as the object i have the past object of this one's perceptions as the object of my memory so Locke says this is the same these two have the same consciousness and he says what i care about is the pain and the pleasure in the future of the person who will share my consciousness that is the person who will remember being me Now, I mean, the step that I don't understand or the thing that I don't understand is, I mean, it seems weird. Shouldn't it be the other way around? Isn't it the one I expect to be? But then I'm not sure. So then what? But in any case, that, that's what Locke says. Locke says, the one I care about in the future is the one who will remember being me. And therefore, like, if something was going to happen in between, and this same human being was going to go on living, but meanwhile, all of memory was lost, irretrievably lost, right? It's important. Of course, I don't ever remember everything that happened to all my past selves, but there, it's somehow retrievable. There's hope of retrieving it if necessary. If we got to the point, and how do we know whether we got to this point? Well, the answer is we don't, but God does, <laughs> right? So if we got to the point where the memories were truly irretrievable, and this human being would never remember being me after now, Locke says, I, punishing them for things that I did would be impossible. I mean, that is, it wouldn't be a punishment for me. That is, that this person is not the same person that I am. And then he says, on the other hand, suppose, so like, suppose now this is T equals one zillion. This is the last day, the day of judgment. <laughs> so here there was some human that continued with that continuity of organic process. And then, it stopped, right? They died. So after this, this same human will never exist again. Right? Because same human means there has to be a continuity of organic process and there can't be. But now on the last day, a new human suddenly starts, right? Like rises out of the grave or whatever. <laughs> Um, so, um, this is not the same human as this one's, but if this one remembers being this one, then it is the same person. Um... What about incurable dementia, someone asks. Well, um, um, so Locke talks about, forget about incurable dementia. What about being so drunk that you can't remember anything? Or even sleepwalking. I don't feel like this is the law now, but maybe I'm wrong. Locke says that the thing that people can be prosecuted for things they do when they're sleepwalking. Um, so why is that? Isn't that not the same person? 
And Locke says, well, really the issue is that um, from the point of view of the civil law, uh, we never know whether people are uh, really sleepwalking or just pretending. We never know whether they're really so drunk that they can't remember. Um, and uh, on the other, so like we have to treat those people as if they, we have to treat it as if there was the same person. On the other hand, when you get to incurable dementia, um, perhaps in that case, we end up treating it as, as he says about the case of madness, we end up treating it, we decide we're going to treat them as not the same person, even though we still don't know, right? Like we don't know that the dementia is incurable. If this story is true, it's in a sense is not incurable. Right, like at the end of this human, it's true that they lost the ability to remember anything. But it was temporary. <laughs> because here, now they suddenly remember everything again. So, uh, and maybe they even remember what happened in this part. So if that's true, then um, it, it wasn't incurable after all. So like, and all questions like this, Locke says, you know, we have to, for purposes of civil law, we have to do the best we can. Um, but of course, as far as the divine law goes, you know, uh, God can know for sure whether someone, whether an action is something that the person will ever be able to remember or not. Okay, and I'm, I'm over time, so I'm sorry, I can't talk about anything more. Um, I will see you, but I will see you tomorrow. Remember, there's going to be a do the revealed divine law. <laughs> um, I'll see you tomorrow. Okay, bye.